When most people think about self-hosting services in their homeland, they often focus and only think about the last mile. And by last mile, I mean the last hop before a user accesses your services. This last hop, whether it's using certificates or a reverse proxy, is incredibly important. But it's also important to know that security starts at the foundation of your home lab. Take, for instance, this diagram. This most likely makes up most things in your home lab. And whether that be physical or virtual, you'll find that you have most of these components. But what if I told you your home lab should look like this? That might seem incredibly complicated, but it's much easier than you think. Today, we're going to discuss some great practices in architecture for self-hosting services within your home lab. We'll dive into individual systems, hardware and configuration, application hosting considerations, network configuration and segmentation, reverse proxies, certificates and two-factor auth, firewall configuration, internet security settings, and we'll even lean into external protection from a provider like Cloudflare. This will cover everything from the last mile all the way down to the hardware. And speaking of hardware, if you're looking for great deals on hardware, you should look no further than our sponsor, Micro Center. If you're a huge nerd like me, one of the best places to shop for all your technology needs is Micro Center. Nothing beats walking into a store and feeling right at home. And that's how I feel the minute I walk into a Micro Center store, each and every time. They have the best deals on gear for gamers, streamers, custom build PCs with performance and budget options, keyboard and accessories, desktops and laptops, and much, much more. Whether you're looking to build your own dream system, networking and storage, pre-built desktops or laptops, home security and home automation, DIY and tech hobbies, even printers and television, or just some help from any of their experts, they really do know what they're talking about, Micro Center should be your destination. Also, Micro Center has been generous enough to give a free SSD to all new customers and is available in store only. So see the link in the description. So be sure to visit your local Micro Center store today. And if you can't make it in, be sure to check them out on the web. Oh, and tell them Techno Tim sent you. They'll have no idea who you're talking about. So what's the best way of protecting yourself while self-hosting? Don't. Just don't do it. Seriously, you don't have to do it. Exposing yourself to the internet also exposes yourself to risks. And the easiest way to mitigate that is to just don't do it at all. I know, that's not why you're here or what you want to hear. So let's move on to the next best step. Also, keep in mind that I'm not a security professional. I'm just some random person on the internet giving you advice. Exposing your services through a self-hosted VPN is probably the next best way of exposing your services without doing it publicly. This will create a secure tunnel from the outside of your network to the inside of your network. From there, you can create firewall rules and limit what the VPN can access. This is a quick win and a secure way of exposing your services, but only the people with VPN access will be able to access them. So you've made it this far and you decided you still want to expose some services publicly. So let's talk about public options. This first option kind of falls into the don't host it at home option, which is to host it in a public cloud. Hosting it in a public cloud still has its own set of concerns, but it does mitigate a lot of the risk of hosting it at home. That's because if that machine gets compromised, they haven't compromised a machine on your local network. They've compromised a machine in the public cloud. But again, that's not why we're here today. We're here to self-host services on our own network. But for those who want to expose some services directly from their home, this is where the fun begins. And again, most people think of the last mile when self-hosting services. It's this path right here. But security starts at a much deeper level. So rather than focus on this last hop right here, we're gonna zoom in and focus on the server that's running your services. You typically don't think of the hardware when you're hosting applications in, in the cloud. You really don't have to. But since we're hosting in our own personal cloud, we do need to consider this. The biggest takeaway here is to be sure that the hardware that your application's running on are patched with the latest firmware. This includes firmware for the server itself, firmware for devices like the motherboard, hard drives, network adapters, and any other device that's physically connected to the server. This also includes any firmware for any router or network device in your environment, but we'll get into configuration here in a little bit. And next, we need to decide if we're going to virtualize our operating system or just run them bare metal. Really, there is no wrong answer here. It really depends on how you want to manage your infrastructure. The key takeaway here is to make sure that your hypervisor is actively maintained, up to date, and fully patched. There are some networking considerations here, but we'll cover that in the networking section, since virtualized network and physical network have a lot of the same concerns. Next is making sure you'll choose a secure operating system 
that your applications will run on. Now, this is a big topic for debate, so we aren't going to go into which ones are more secure. But you have choices like Windows, Embedded, and many flavors of Linux. Here are the takeaways. You'll want to use one that's still supported and not end of life. You'll want to patch all of these regularly and work it into your maintenance schedule. You'll also want to use the principle of least privilege, meaning giving the minimum level of access to any user on this system. You'll also want to be sure you don't run anything as root or admin. You'll also want to restrict who has access to these machines and try not to install additional services on these machines. It's also a good idea, if you can, to use an application firewall and at the end of the day, the OS should be purposely built and maintained. If you're running containers, you'll have much of the same concerns as you do with an operating system, however, at a much smaller scale. You'll first want to make sure that your containerization engine is up to date. Whether that be Docker, Containerd, or Podman, or any other, you want to be sure that this service is patched and up to date. Also, I recommend using containers from official sources. This can be a challenge, but you'll want to be sure that you're getting containers from the maintainer themselves or from a reputable source, something like linuxserver.io. And after you've chosen your container, you'll want to check to see if they support a minimal image, one that's built on something like Alpine. The reason you'll want to do this is for a couple of reasons. First of all, you get a smaller container. Next, this container now has less attack surface. Containers with less dependencies means less to worry about and containers with less dependencies have less to patch or the possibility of vulnerabilities. So if you choose a container that has more services, that's more to patch, more with the possibility of vulnerabilities, and overall, more to worry about. After you've selected your container, you'll also want to take into consideration the tags that you use. Now, this is kind of a double-edged sword because most people want to pin their containers to latest to ensure that they have the latest container. And then they'll use something like Watchtower to update it automatically. However, keep in mind that latest may not have gone through the same testing and rigor that a tagged version of an image has. This convention is really going to be up to the container maintainer. But my general guidance is, looking at the Nginx container, is that if you can pin to a specific version, like this one, 1.21.5-alpine, that's a good bet. Or you can pin to a less specific version, like 1-alpine, or even 1.21-alpine. And then, if all else fails, you can pin to latest. If you really wanted a high level of specificity, you could actually pin to this digest here, but that's going a little far. But this does add some maintenance over time, and you'll need to work this into your maintenance rotation. But the takeaway here is that the higher level of specificity on your tag means that it's more easily reproduced in the future. And now on to networking. There are two sections to networking that are equally important, internal networking and external networking. Starting with internal networking. It's a must to segment your network if you're planning on self-hosting applications. The idea behind network segmentation is that you divide your network into multiple segments or subnet, each acting like its own small network. This allows you to control the flow of the network between two networks and even internally based on a network policy. This can not only improve performance, but also security. You can do this by subnetting or VLANs, and this allows you to keep trusted devices separate from devices that are connected or exposed to the internet or untrusted devices. This can help mitigate the risk that if one of these devices get compromised, they can only communicate with other devices on this network. And if you have a network policy in place, they can't get through to your trusted devices, thus mitigating the risk. This is not only a good idea for machines that are publicly exposed to the internet, but also a good idea for IoT devices. But maybe more on that some other time. The takeaway here is to segment your network to mitigate risk. And now on to external network. This is where the real fun begins. This is how users and devices enter your network. And for obvious reasons, you want to be sure that only the ports you need to be forwarded are forwarded to the proper device. In most cases, you'll be hosting something like a website. And if that's the case, you want to be sure that it's only going to port forward 443 for HTTPS 
to the server that it's running on. You don't want to open any additional ports. And in most cases, you'll want to port forward that to a reverse proxy that sits in front of your website. However, I highly recommend using a public reverse proxy along with your own. So Cloudflare provides a reverse proxy, even with a free tier, that you can use to improve performance, somewhat protect your IP online, provide some caching, TLS encryption or certificates, and I think most importantly, protect your site from attacks. Cloudflare is able to detect and block malicious attacks if you use them for DNS. And if you use them for DNS, your DNS will point at them at their reverse proxy. And it's in their best interest to detect and block these types of attacks since an attack on you is really an attack against them. And this might sound complicated to set up, but it's as easy as using a dynamic DNS container or a script that updates your domain to point to Cloudflare. Then this will route all traffic through their reverse proxy and forward it on to you with TLS encryption. And if you're ever under attack, you can simply turn on attack mode and force the JavaScript language challenge when people visit it. So that attackers get stopped, but real human beings get through. And you can see some of my stats here. You can see lots of requests are being routed through Cloudflare. You can see the total bandwidth over time. You can see how many unique visitors visited. And then you can also check out the security piece. And you can see from this chart that they've actually blocked some threats. And these were blocked at the Cloudflare level, and they never made it down to my reverse proxy. You could see threats by country, by region, and the type of crawlers or bots. I feel like setting up Cloudflare is a huge win for privacy, security, and protection. But what's stopping anyone from just going directly to my IP address? What happens if someone figures out my IP address and wants to bypass Cloudflare altogether? Well, in this setup, nothing at all. Don't worry, friends. There are ways to protect against this too. This is where we'll combine our port forwarding rules along with Cloudflare. We'll force anyone from the outside coming in to go through Cloudflare. And if they don't, we'll just block them. So it looks like this. Cloudflare publishes their list of IP ranges. This is super helpful because we can build rules based on these IP ranges. See where I'm going here? From these list of rules, we can build a conditional port forward to say that if you're not coming from one of these sources, just block. And if you are, let them through. And it looks like this. I'm basically doing conditional port forwarding. And I'm using a UDM and it works just the same, probably a lot easier on PFSense. But if we look at one of these rules, what we're saying that, hey, if the source is a Cloudflare IP on the port of 443, that's HTTPS, then we'll forward to our reverse proxy. Otherwise, we drop it. And I had to do this quite a few times in UDM because there isn't an easy way to do this, but it's much easier if you're using PFSense. And if you're using something else, just look at your port forwarding rules and see if they support conditional port forwarding. And since we're talking about Cloudflare, we may as well talk about some firewall rules too that you can set up there. Now, some people will block entire countries from their firewall or even block Tor. Now, I've never really found these to be too helpful because most of the time, bad actors are just gonna use a VPN in your local country and come in that way. But if you do wanna block countries, it's here in firewall rules. But while we're talking about networking and firewalls, we should also talk about IDS, which is Intrusion Detection System, and IPS, which is Intrusion Prevention System. And generally speaking, these are just ways to detect and block attacks based on some signatures. They do this by analyzing the request and the traffic, and then seeing if that matches a signature, and then alerting you if you have IDS turned on, and blocking it if you have IPS turned on. Now, I would definitely turn these both on, self-hosting or not, because they block against known attacks. Now, I say known because they're only as good as the signatures that you have. So if you're running something like PFSense, that'll be Snort or Suricata. And if you're running UDM Pro, it'll be right here under firewall and security. But you wanna make sure that you detect and block and then you can set a sensitivity level. Here, I have mine to the highest possible. And here, we can see the list of threat categories. Now, I have these all turned on. And you might have some additional toggles like dark web blocker and malicious website blocker, but you wanna make sure that all of the security systems that your firewall supports are turned on and up to date. And you'll wanna make sure that you regularly check these. 
For me, that's as simple as going into notifications and making sure that any intrusion attempts were blocked. And now that we have everything in place, we can finally meet in the middle and use our own internal reverse proxy. Arguably, you don't need one if you're using Cloudflare, but I do it with or without Cloudflare. So a reverse proxy is an easy way to direct traffic from your clients to one of your servers. We talked about this with Cloudflare. And it's also a place where you can have your certificates. Having them here versus each individual server makes maintenance much easier. And setting up a reverse proxy can be challenging. However, I've already documented this in a video and the reverse proxy I usually choose is traffic. Traffic can route requests to your servers and get publicly signed certificates for you to use and even integrate with other systems using middleware. So speaking of middleware, another choice you'll have to make is whether or not you want your services to have authentication or not. Some services do provide authentication, but they may not support two-factor authentication. This is where something like Authalia comes into play. Authalia is an auth proxy that works with your reverse proxy to provide authentication and authorization for your services, even if they don't have authentication of their own. This is great for applications that need another layer of protection and with two-factor authentication helps give you confidence that your apps can be accessed by you and only you. We'll put him upside down because he's mad because auth is in the middle, but whatever. This is definitely an advanced use case and should only be set up after you have all of this already running. After we have this last step set up, we've gone all the way from the end user going through Cloudflare to your firewall, configured a firewall with protection, set up a reverse proxy, then set up an auth proxy. And for a server, we've configured our hardware and the operating system, and then our service if it's running in a container. You should now have a little more confidence in self-hosting some things in your home lab. And remember, you don't have to do any of this. If you feel uncomfortable or you're not ready, you could still fall back to a VPN or host it in a public cloud or do nothing at all. And there are also some side quests we didn't talk about like tunneling, but you could set this up different altogether. So what do you think about self-hosting some services at home? Do you not want to expose anything publicly but your VPN? Did I miss anything in my guide? Let me know in the comment section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Merstein here from the Netherlands. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Funny, I, I, I won't go into there, but People at work joke around because they're like, you must be big in the Netherlands. And I was like, actually a, a, a fair portion of my traffic on YouTube comes from the Netherlands. But they, they joke around with me because once I jumped on a, a call at work and the people on the other side of the call were from the Netherlands. And one guy was like, are you Techno Tim? Do you have a YouTube channel? I kind of, I didn't even see it in chat. And then later on the, you know, they were teasing me at work. They're like, you must be huge in the Netherlands because that guy recognized you. And I didn't even see in chat that he had said he knew who I was because it was a Zoom chat, not like anywhere else. And that's obviously class. But anyways, long story short, someone from from work when I was on a call recognized me. I was like, oh, that's that's pretty awesome. Anyways, uh, thank you and welcome uh, from the U.S. Thank you for being here.